uh, how they arise. Yes, so, so uh, by the end of the, uh, so, yeah, so since the recording just started, maybe I should just quickly uh, for, the, for, the, for the recording, just say um, that uh, I'm going to begin by sort of finishing up last time's lecture um, because we, uh, you know, had some topics that uh, we didn't complete in the, in the previous lecture. Um, as you know, I'm just, we are getting to know each other and getting to know the audience. Um, and I spent some time discussing things that uh, were not initially part of the plan. So I'm going to deviate a little bit from the uh, from the day by day description of the abstracts and the overall uh, you know the description of the lecture series will remain unchanged. It's just uh, today's lecture instead of starting with uh, classification of topological field theories, I'm just going to continue where I left off last time. And uh, so you know, as I was saying, I'm not going to be uh, discussing technical details very much in this lecture series. It's more to give a broad picture of what the subject is about and, and what higher cat. So by the end of the lecture series, um, I should have, you, you should leave with an idea of what higher categories are and uh, the fact that they arise in various areas of mathematics. That's something that uh, I hope to bring out. And also that they, they build bridges between different areas. The higher, higher category theory builds bridges between um, seemingly very disparate areas of mathematics, okay? So, uh, so the technical details will be kept to a minimum. So the outline for the last lecture was we began with motivation, then I was going to discuss models for higher categories and some examples. So what we did is we saw, you know, we discussed some motivation and we saw one model for an infinity category, what an infinity category is. And I'm gonna st start off from there. And uh, in constructing that model, we actually were studying one example. We, was, we, we saw that starting from any topological space, you can construct an infinity groupoid, which is called the fundamental infinity groupoid of the space. So we've already seen one example, but I want to sort of just bring all those threads together. Okay, so I'm gonna to move to the end of these uh, notes. And uh, let's begin with a quick uh, recap of uh, so I'll begin with a definition. Okay. So let me just begin with a definition that summarizes a lot of things we did last time. So the definition is that a simplicial set, uh, a functor, so X, a simplicial set, which is a functor from delta op, This category of finite ordinals is the category delta. It's a function from delta op to sets. So if I have a simplicial set, then the simplicial set is a Khan complex. If it satisfies the horn filling condition, So what is this? Let me just write it in um, as, a, as a diagram. For every n, we have the k horn sitting inside the n simplex. Um, I, what was my notation for this? Uh, this was, I guess, something like this, uh, where, where this delta n is uh, eight sub n, which is harm of blank into n. It just maps into n. That's the abstract um, n simplex thought of as a pre sheaf on delta op or functor from delta op to sets. And we want that if I give um, a map from, from this horn into, into some simplicial set X, then it extends. There exists an extension. Okay. So the restriction from n simplices to their horns is, um, is subjective. For, for all k with zero less than or equal to k less than or 10. And um, here's a picture of what, uh, how you imagine sort of this, this horn is that it's all the faces that don't contain the, uh, the sorry, that contain k. So, so for example, this zero, one, two, this is the horn wedge uh, two of zero. Okay. 
that's a picture of that. Um, okay, so 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 then we, and we also made this definition that an infinity group we can think of this. We said we can think of this as an infinity group word, and I'm going to make another definition and tell you what an infinity category is. So let me just add uh, here. I'm just going to use this color. Let's say a weak. Or maybe I should write it here. It's a bit confusing. Let's say, uh, let's make another definition here. X is a weak con complex if uh, it satisfies the horn filling condition. Condition for all inner horns. So, what are inner horns? I.e., for one less than k less than n. Okay. So, uh, in a moment, I'll. Uh, so, just the same condition that we have in this diagram star, except that we require it to hold only for one less than k less than n. We don't require it to hold for the two endpoints. So let's see why uh, what this gives us. Okay, so let's look at the two horns. Okay, so um, so we can think of. Okay, so before I write that, let's see, we can think of think of a weak con complex. AK quasi category. As a higher categorical structure, uh, as, um, and it, let me just call this as an infinity category. Okay, or maybe as a model for the notion of infinity category. So intuitively, an infinity category is something that has objects, that has morphisms between objects, then it has transformations between those morphisms and transformations between those and so on. So the objects were the vertices. And the arrows were the elements of X1, the one simplices. And composition of arrows, I should tell you how arrows are composed. Composition is not, uh, is not defined. It's, you don't specify one particular composition, but you simply encode abstractly all possible compositions that you could define that, uh, you know, so th this infinity category is defined by giving a family of possible compositions, a family of compositions, and uh, those, that family should satisfy some sort of higher associativity and so on. So I'm going to explain how, how that look uh, works in this in this setting. So composition is is defined as follows: If you have f and g belonging to x1, you get you get the horn This is a horn in horn wedge. So this is zero, one, and two in your imagination. Uh, this is a horn, let's call this x0, x1, x2. This is a uh, horn which to one x. And by the filling property, I can find one not necessarily unique, uh, two simplex that fills this out. And this two simplex sigma witnesses, and let's call the, the third edge of this two simplex, whatever that is. So the, the boundary one of sigma is by definition what I call H. H is a composite, a composition or a composite of F and G. And sigma is a witness of this. To 
to the statement that f that f composed with g quote unquote equals h so instead of the idea in higher category theories you replace equalities by isomorphisms so instead of saying that f composed with g equals h i'm saying that sigma is an isomorphism of f composed with g and h right so uh, the two simplex witnesses the fact that h is a composite of f and g now um Maybe uh, I used H here. That's a bit unfortunate. Um, okay, maybe uh, let's call this. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, let's move on. So let, let's talk about now associativity. So just observe here that I only use the inner horn. I only use the horn. Uh, so the one here, this is the horn wedge to one. So it's the horn that, that is defined by the vertex one, and one is strictly bigger than zero and strictly less than two. It's an, it's an inner horn, right? So I didn't use the boundary horn yet. So let's talk about associativity. Well, associativity comes from the following thing. So let's suppose I'm given F G H in X one. Now I can try to define, uh, try to understand the possible compositions of F and G and the different ways of bracketing those compositions. So, so let's understand what that, what happens. Let's look at uh, the tetrahedron. So sorry, my drawing isn't great. I hope this works out. Oops. Let's try again. Um, there we go. Okay, I hope that's understandable. Okay. So I'm going to put. My first edge is F. My second edge is well, the edge is G, and my third edge is H. So this is zero, X naught, X one, X two, X three. So X naught, X one, X two, X three are simplices. So they're objects in my higher category. F, G, and H are th are thought of as arrows. So they are morphisms. And um, I want to understand what it means to compose, right? So I have not chosen these these edges. Oops. I have not yet chosen uh, th this one. I've chosen. I apologize. So the edges I have not chosen. I have not yet chosen this edge. I have not chosen this edge. I have not chosen this edge. Now, if I choose a composite. Um, of f and g that amounts to filling the simplex the horn defined by f and g so I, I can fill out the bottom one and i get and i get something which i call one possible definition of f composed with g would be for each simplex i get a possible definition of f composed with g and i can do the same thing for uh, g and h and i would fill out this one okay um and that would give me uh G composed with H. So whatever goes on on the edge connecting X1 to X3 would be G composed with H. But I could also fill out um, the, the, the phase containing H and F composed with G. Right? So let's fill out all the faces. Uh, fill out. So, so choosing simplices sigma sigma prime, new new prime, witnessing, I mean, uh, sigma, okay, so let me write, like the sigma is a witness that, um, witness for F composed with G. Sigma prime, a witness, for uh, H composed with G, so just G composed with F. H composed with G, a mu a witness for um, H composed with G composed with F, mu prime a witness for What's the other one? So I want to do that. Have G, uh, so yeah, so H composed with G 
Right, so if I if I choose witnesses for all these composites, which means I'm also choosing a composite decomposed with F, I hope it's clear what this means. I, well, what I'm doing is basically filling out the horn. So this is equivalent to filling the horn to uh, to giving a horn, sorry, to giving a horn. A wedge, which one is this opposite? It's opposite two. And so wedge three, two, two X. So uh, all the faces containing the vertex two have been filled out when I when I choose composites like this. And so by the, the horn filling condition implies that I can fill out the three simplex. And the face, the two simplex, so D2 of this, let's call this theta. So D2 of theta is the face that's in front of me in, the, in this picture, in the tetrahedron, the one closest to me. So D2 of theta witnesses that the composites I've defined, the so-called G composed with F is this, uh, sorry, that H composed with G composed with F Uh, is a composite, uh, you know, well, equals H composed with G composed with F. So it's not equals, but uh, is a witness for the fact that these two composites agree, if you like, uh, that these are both composites of F, G, and H. So basically this encodes all possible ways to compose things. And it tells you that uh, at the next level up, when you look at a higher level simplex, the ways of bracketing, the, the order in which you did the composition didn't, didn't matter up to a higher simplex, up to a higher homotopy. Um, that, that's what this is saying. So this is a heuristic discussion. I'm just trying to say, what is associativity in this context? It's exactly the statement that um, this higher associativity is the statement that you can fill out the, 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 the tetrahedron. Any questions about that? Right. So I, I first fill out the, the bottom uh, triangle that gives me F composed with G, gives me one definition of F composed with G. Then I fill out the right-hand triangle that gives me a definition, sorry, then I fill out the leftmost triangle that gives me a definition of H composed F composed G. Now I simultaneously fill out the, the third triangle on the right, which is which gives me a definition of H composed with, sorry, H composed with G. And by the horn filling condition, I can now fill out the whole triangle, the whole three simplex. And that tells me that this definition of, when I do H composed with G composed with F, I, th that thing is isomorphic to um, the, other, the other bracketing. Maybe I should say is isomorphic to, or maybe homotopic to, instead of equals. But now you can go to higher simplices. You can ask, you know, this data that I provided, is that coherent at higher levels? And you can keep going. Okay, so, 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 so this motivates the idea that uh, a, a simplicial set with this horn filling condition is one way to talk about infinity categories. Anyway, okay, so let's leave that behind for a second now. And let's talk about why uh, I called uh, a Khan complex an infinity groupoid. So in an infinity groupoid, so in, intuitively, heuristically, What should it be? An infinity groupoid should be an infinity category in which every one morphism is invertible up to homotopy. homotopy or isomorphism. Okay, so for this, I need all horns, not just the inner horns, because let's see, 
So suppose I, I have an element f. So let f be an, an arrow f from x0 to x1. And I want to invert this guy. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take this horn with f on one, one edge. And I'm going to put the identity of x1 on this edge. Oh, sorry, identity of x0 naught, x naught on this edge. Well, by the horn filling condition, if, if, if I have a weak con complex, uh, sorry, a con complex and not just a weak con complex, then I can fill this out. And I get something over here. And let's call this uh, G. Then this simplex sigma, sigma witnesses Maybe this I can use this similar, uh, you know, isomorphic uh, symmetric sign to say that this is um, equivalent. Uh, G composed F is equivalent to identity of x naught. So this is the sense in which F is invertible. It's invertible up to homotopy. So F G G times composed F identity is is a composite of G composed F of G and F. That's the statement that you know what it means to be invertible up to homotopy. So so this is why uh, so the upshot. Is a, is a con complex is a model for what we want to call for infinity groupoids. Okay, so uh, and what we saw last time is that every topological space gives rise to a con complex. So last time. If X is any space, you, you get this con complex sing X uh, complex. And if I think of this as an infinity groupoid, this is what you would call the fundamental infinity groupoid. This infinity groupoid pi less than equal to infinity x is modeled by sing x. So, so uh, why should I think of this as an infinity groupoid? Um, uh, uh, sorry, what do I say? What is why do I call this a fundamental infinity groupoid? Because it generalizes the fundamental groupoid or the fundamental group. So, if you have the points of x, and then you look at the paths of x, if you were looking at the fundamental groupoid, you would identify homotopic paths. But in our in the higher categorical philosophy, you should never say two things are equal. You should provide the identifications between them. So you look at the homotopies between those paths and provide that as data. And uh, this pi less than or equal to infinity of x remembers that data as well. And then going up higher data, what are the identifications between the identifications and so on. So that's what sing x is. Okay. And then we uh, we stated this uh, theorem, the proposition. Just recalling last time that there's an adjunction from top suitable definition of top insert a suitable definition of say com you could take all topological spaces for this definition um, and uh, so the, the functor going this direction is sing x so sing of blank and the functor going the opposite direction is the geometric realization. Given a simplicial set, we could construct a space. Okay. So spaces and simplicial sets are closely related. So home in home from geometric realization of some simplicial set to, to some topological space Y is equivalent to home from X dot to sing Y. Okay. Um, So while we're talking about this, let me state another uh, uh, theorem, which is how our, uh, so for I, you know, I got some feedback from students, maybe uh, some of this stuff is 
you have not seen this kind of way of thinking about topology before, but you've probably seen what a chain complex is. So let me uh, tell you how simplicial sets are related to chain complexes. So definition, a chain complex, is uh, over, let's say, Z is a collection of abelian groups K is an abelian group. And these maps are DK, this is DK. Um, no, this should be D, K minus one. Okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's just call it D. So these maps D. And you want D squared is equal to zero. D, decomposed with D is zero. Right? And uh, we care about them because they're used to construct invariants of topological spaces. That's how they arise. And they basically arise because of simplicial sets. So, so let me explain the connection. So, uh, well, also make part of the definition is the definition of homology is that the homology of the chain complex. Is by definition the kernel of B by the image of T okay. in, uh, in degree K. So, well, this is the set of X in VK such that the DX is zero divided by the set of X in VK such that X is DY for some Y. Now, um, so is the homology, and uh, here's the th here's a the theorem. If there is an equivalence of categories, of simplicial abelian groups, which are functors from delta op to abelian groups. Uh, to chain complexes concentrated in positive degrees. So these are called connective chain complexes. These are uh, called simplicial abelian groups. So if instead of taking sets, I take um, abelian groups as the target for, for this functors from delta op, then that category is nothing but the category, I mean, it's equivalent to the category of chain complexes concentrated in non-negative degrees. And, and what is the, the functor? So this functor N and gamma. So N is related to this functor called C. So for any simplicial abelian group, X, I can define well, maybe I should not call it C, okay. C of X dot is CN of X dot is XN and D from CN of X dot to CN minus one of X dot is the alternating sum minus one to the I DI where DIs are the, are the faces of, um, of the um, simplicial set those maps di that I defined before. And you can define a variant uh, called n of x. So n, n of x is the subset of c n of x, uh, consist which, is the which is by definition the intersection, the kernels of di from i equal to zero to n minus one. So this is something, uh, but technically, I mean, you can work this out. 
um, it's not it's fairly straightforward to write down to check that then D restricts to this thing and so on. But uh, anyway, so the upper thing is something that uh, is quite easy to to motivate, and you can you can define D by this formula and check that D squared is zero, just following from the simplicial identities. But I'm saying something much more than that. I'm saying that this functor n is actually an equivalent subcategories. Okay. Um, and furthermore, if you have a simplicial set, you can define its homotopy groups. Uh, so, so this is a, a, a small aside for those who know what homotopy groups are. The homotopy groups of the simplicial set, which are the homotopy groups of its geometricalization. If you like, you can take this as a definition of, of the homotopy groups of the simplicial set uh, are the same thing as the homology groups of this chain complex. So, so homology is like studying homotopy in a linear context. So this is another motivation for why uh, you should care about simplicial sets. And I'm going to, this will uh, come up again later in, in, in this, uh, when we talk about this. Okay, so, so let's go back to homotopy theory. So we were looking at spaces so where did we start? We started out by saying that spaces uh, in homotopy theory are, are not really defined by, uh, you know, looking at open sets and so on. That, that's not, that does not reflect what homotopy theorists really care about. What we really care about are the paths in the space, the paths of paths and paths of paths of paths and so on. And, and what is that? We were looking at, uh, uh, so X some space, we could look at paths of X, which is maps from I into X. We can look at paths of paths X, which is maps from I into maps I X, which is maps from I cross I into X and so on, right? So for every space X, we have a rule that produces a new space, the paths in X, and then we can iterate this process. And that's what I'm saying that basically homotopy theory cares about is what paths in a space are between two points. Um, if you're a computer scientist, you might think of this a bit differently. You might think of a space as being a, a type, a type of uh, object that you define and a path in the space, oh, sorry, uh, an element of the space, a point in the space is a term of type X where X is some type. And there's this operation in, uh, in, in this language that allows you to produce a new type, which is the paths in the original type, which you know, if, you, if you're a computer scientist, it's, it's written like uh, identity, the identity type of X, um, uh, if you like, which is a set of identifications of terms of type X. That itself is a type and you can define terms of that type and so on. So that's how ho people who do something called homotopy type theory think of this. Uh, and that's related to you know things that can be implemented on a computer and so on. So the point here is that a SpaceX is not really, doesn't have to be thought of as a set uh, and it, it paths as some continuous maps or something like that. You can think of paths as some primitive entity, which is things that identify uh, two things and they have different incarnations in point set topology. You can think of those paths as continuous maps from the interval into the space. Uh, in a uh, simplicial set world, you can think of it as maps from the simplicial set Delta one into my simplicial set. And if you're doing homotopy type theory, you think of these as primitive concepts where given a term, uh, given a, a type, you can define a new type, the set of paths. Okay, so uh, so let's look at the, the re relative setting. So we look at maps from, you have X comma X based space. And then you look at, uh, maps, based paths. Well, let me not write based paths, but let me just say, you look at, um, you start with maps from I relative to its boundary into X comma X. So the, so the rule is that you only look at maps that take the boundary component uh, into this point, okay? Uh, and then you can look at, so let's call this relative paths. And you can look at relative, relative paths of paths. 
you like, which is maps from i comma boundary of i into maps from i comma boundary of i comma x and so on. Right? But let's look at what this is. This is just maps from the sphere. If I sorry, the circle with a base point star into x comma x. And if you keep going down, this is just maps from i n boundary of i n to x comma x, which is maps from s n with a base point into x comma x. Right. So you can think of if you do a relative version of looking at paths, you get maps from from the circle with a base point into into my space, and you can define omega dot. Uh, sorry, omega x to be maps from S1 with a base point into, into x comma x. And you keep going, and you look at maps from omega n of x is by definition, you iterate this process. And if you just saw this is equivalent to looking at maps, well, this is, if you like loops of, so this is called the loop space. Maybe you should write that down. Because this is a space of loops in, the, in, in a given space. So you're looking at uh, some space and you have a point, which is your X the base point, And you're looking at loops at that base point. That's what a map from the circle is. And, and you can of course iterate this process and you can define omega N of X to be loops of omega n minus one of x. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the with writing on this. Uh, omega n minus one of x, which is also thought of as maps from the n sphere with a base point. Doesn't matter which base point you pick into x comma x, right? So you can define, define these uh, iterated loop spaces and this gives you a way to, to define, I mean, this is what you're studying in homotopy theory if you care about uh, paths, and but you're fixed a base point. And you can take, at each stage, you can take connected components. And the thing that we call the nth homotopy group is just the, the connected components of omega n of x. Right? So this is a basic invariant in homotopy theory. Uh, you can study spaces and you, uh, when, you, when you study their shape, you're led to this definition of uh, just naturally by looking at parts and looking at parts of parts and so on, you're led to this notion of the homotopy group, right? the nth homotopy group of the space. And this is what in a way homotopy theorists care about uh, as I've explained to you. I mean, they, you're interested in looking at parts. And so this is the basic invariant that encodes parts and parts between parts and so on. Um, so, um, okay, so this so is the enthomotopy group. So this leads to two, two questions. Okay, so now I can really come to the, the crux of the matter. So we led to two questions. Question one is give a description. So as a homotopy theorist, you wanna declare two spaces to be equivalent um, so let me write that here, so homotopy theory. Whether you model them as, as topological spaces or as simplicial sets, you wanna say that two spaces, so spaces X and Y, let me just make a, a, a definition actually, let me just call this a definition. Definition, a map, of spaces f from x to y is a weak homotopy equivalence if the induced map pi n of f mapping pi n of x to pi n of y is a homotopy equivalence. So is an is, is an isomorphism, I apologize. Is an iso for all for all n. Okay, 
So question one is to describe the, the category of, of homotopy types. In other words, describe the category obtained from top by inverting weak homotopy equivalences. And question two is um, also a, re a related question. Um, so as we saw that loop spaces are things that naturally arise when you start to study uh, spaces, uh, primarily as objects into which you're interested in paths and deformations and deformations of those and so on. So you could, the natural question is, when is a space X? So given a space Y, When is there a space X? Space here means either topological space or simplicial set, such that loops N of X is equivalent to Y. I won't have time to explain why this is such an important question, but it's a fundamentally important question in algebraic topology because when you want to study cohomology theories, cohomology theories are represented by what are called spectra. Every cohomology theory corresponds to something called a spectrum. And a spectrum is basically an infinite loop space, a space that is obtained by infinitely looping some other space, right? So it's, it's of the form omega n of x for any n. Uh, and uh, so constructing spectra amounts to asking when is something, uh, you know, is, um, is related to understanding this question. Let's put it that way. So uh, that's why it has a fundamental importance in algebraic topology. So let me describe uh, two theorems that answer that give you a way to answer this question. Okay, uh, answer both these questions. So I'm gonna begin with the first question. Okay, so are the questions clear? Maybe this is a good moment to pause. Yes, sorry. Was there a question? In question two, uh, what is this n? Is there any condition for n? I mean, fix n. Or some fix n. n. No, fix an n to start with. Fix an n. Okay. Yeah, Thank thanks. That's a great question. You fix any n, fix an n, n could be one. There'll be a theorem for every n. So you fix an n and ask the question, given a space y, when is that a loop space? Okay. I'm going to describe the answer, and I'm going to describe the answer to that question to you. Okay, so so here's a here's the answer to that question. Maybe let me begin with the with the second question. So here's the answer to that question. Um, so here's a uh, here's the thing that we observe. So observe that if you look at the loop space, there's a you can, there's an operation on the loop space. You can take two loops and you can compose them. So we have an operation composition on loops X for any X. So it's, it's if you have two paths, you can compose them, number one, number two. And how do you do this? You simply run gamma one on the first part and gamma two on the second part. So this is zero, uh, one. So you define gamma one gamma two star gamma one of P to be equal to gamma one of P for zero less than, oh, sorry, gamma one of two T. For zero less than equal to T less than equal to the half. And you define it to be gamma two, oh, sorry, yeah, gamma two of what, two T minus one. Uh, yeah, can you set right? Two T minus one. Right, so this is one way to define a composition. But in fact, observe that you have actually much more than this. Okay, uh, you have a composition for every way of dividing the interval into two subintervals. But uh, before I say that, let me observe that this composition.
is not strictly associative. But so, but is associative up to homotopy. So what does that mean? Observe that if you if you write if if you take the divide into half and then divide into one another half and you put one, gamma one gamma two gamma three, and you could do it the other way. You could do half three fourth. And here you have gamma two gamma three. And here you have gamma one. I can join them up by a picture like this, where uh, I mean this is a two-dimensional region, okay. and this is the homotopy, which witnesses in the language before, but now it's a it's a it's a different way to think about the same thing that I was saying earlier. This witnesses the fact that gamma three star gamma one, sorry star gamma two star gamma one. Is is homotopic to gamma three star gamma two. Okay. So um, this this two dimensional picture is a witness. Uh, this homotopy is, is a witness that these two things are equivalent, are homotopic. It's a path. So everything in homotopy theory, everything in higher category theory. Every equality is a path or an isomorphism. You never say two things are equal, but you specify that isomorphism. So here I'm specifying it, right? So these are equivalent, if you like, and equality is replaced by equivalence. So th these two paths are equivalent. Okay. So so just uh, this is just to observe that. But in fact, we have uh, we have a composition, a, a law of composition. Um, for every configuration, of two little in, of two intervals inside zero one. So if I have my zero one, and I have two little intervals embedded into it, I can run gamma one on this part, gamma two on this part, and the rest of it just goes to the constant, the, the base point, right? In fact, for all n, okay, let me make a, a definition. So, so define let us define. E one of n is a topological space. E one of n is defined to be the set of configurations of k disjoint intervals. Sorry, n disjoint intervals. Let's call this k. I apologize. E k. Uh, configurations of k disjoint intervals okay. in zero one. Then we have maps. Then we then for every point in E one of k, we have an operation which takes k loops and combines them and gives me a single loop. I simply run. The first loop gamma one on the first interval, second loop on the second, and so on. Okay. So let's. Uh, so we have a map E one of K to maps from Omega. X to the power k to omega x, okay. and these are compatible with various. Um, so, so, furthermore, we have operations e one of 
k times p1 of j1 p1 of j r to p1 of summation j r oh sorry e1 of j j k e1 of summation j k which are uh, obtained by so you take your big interval and suppose i'm given k little intervals then inside the first little interval i can put j1 intervals These are k intervals. So inside the, the first interval, I can put j1 intervals and so on. j2 intervals here. And then I can simply delete the, the outside of the intervals. The, the outside of the k intervals, and I'm left with the sum of j1 plus j2 plus j j r uh, sorry j k intervals, right? So that's this map, and these composition laws, these composition maps. So let's call these um, okay. Let's call these maps something. Let's call this sigma k. Uh, I'm sorry. Just excuse me. I'm getting a, a kind of a burning smell here. I just want to make sure there's no a fire. I'll just, I'll just be right back. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I had to just uh, get that check. I'm sorry. Yeah, about that. All right, this. Yeah, I think it's okay. I just smell smoke, and I want to make sure it's just something outside and not uh, in the building. So, okay. uh, I think it's okay. Uh, there's often things burning here. So, in uh, you know, if you go around in India, you have people burning things. Yeah. But as long as it's not in the building, um, it's not a critical emergency. I guess it's a long-term emergency. <laughs> okay. Anyway, okay. So I think it's okay. So, uh, right, so where was I? Right, so we have these maps and uh, for every, um, so where was I? I have half an hour. So, so for every uh, K, I have these maps, sigma K, and um, uh, these maps are compatible with these compositions, okay? So I, I let you kind of think about in what sense they're compatible, um, but uh, all of this says that all of this says that, um, so the maps sigma k are compatible with these operations.
So you summarize this by saying, well, you say that omega k of x is an algebra, sorry, omega of x is an algebra over the operad. This is just lingo to describe what I just said over the operad E1, which is the defined by this collection of spaces E1 of k. So for every k, I have a I have carry operations from omega, you know, carry operations on omega x, which are parameterized by points of E1 of k. Right. And these encode uh, the fact that uh, this uh, space um, has a multiplication and that this multiplication is associative up to homotopy. So if, if you look at, for example, this picture I drew, th this is an example of a three-area operation. This picture I drew is an example of a three-area operation where you have three intervals embedded into a big interval. So the to understand the associativity of the binary operation, we need the operation involving the tertiary operation, uh, or turn, what's it called, ternary or something, uh, the, the operation involving three inputs to understand what associativity even means in this context, right? So all of the structure and all algebra over the even operand is also called an A-infinity operand. And, and obviously I, I, I talked about the E1 case, I call this E1 because you can play the same game for, for any N in any dimension, right? So I can go back to this whole story and I can replace, um, I can start here and I can replace uh, loops by a K fold loop space, sorry, N fold loop space, omega NX. And then instead of composing loops, I would be composing spheres. And so I would get an action of the EN operand. So let me just define what the EN operand is. Definition. As we define E N of K is equal to the space of configurations of K little disks in the standard N disk. in the unit N disk. So, and again, if I have a, a K disk and I, for each K, I choose J1 disks, uh, J2 disk, J3 disks and so on up to JK, I can put, the first J1 disks into uh, the first uh, disk. This is my disk one, D1. Let's say I can put the first K, uh, K uh, sorry, J1 disk into D1, the next J2 disk into D2, and so on, and then delete D1, D2, and, and DK. And I'll be left with summation uh, J1, uh, J1 plus J2 plus J3 all the way up to JK, number of disks sitting in the standard unit disk. So this uh, structure this, with this law of composition is what's called the EN operator. And we have maps. Um, we have maps En of k to com omega n of x raised to k to omega n of x for any topological space. Compatible. with composition in EN. Okay. So you say that, uh, so you say that uh, omega k of x is an, oper is an algebra over the, oh, sorry, omega n of x. Is an algebra over the E n of that. Okay. What it means to be an algebra is to give for every point in E n of k an operation, a k-ary operation on 
the object that you're considering, in this case, the n-fold loop space. And it's obvious how to do it in this case, you simply put each of these disks uh, gives you uh, an n-fold loop in the space and you send everything outside the disk to the base point. Everything outside these k disks goes to the base point in Right. So that's exactly what it means to give, um, you know, to, so what we're doing is we're taking K uh, N disks and combining them and, uh, sorry, N spheres in my space and combining them to give a single map of the N sphere into my space. So, so here's the theorem. The theorem for the E1 case is due to Stashev and the theorem in the EN case is due to me. Okay. Uh, maybe just make one definition finally. One more definition, just say the theorem. Definition and EN algebra is group like if EN algebra A is group like if pi zero of A, well, pi zero of A is a monoid automatically, right? Uh, so you want this. Uh, it's a monoid under the, the, the composition we have defined. And so we want this monoid to be a group. Every element should have an inverse. If pi zero A is a group. So in our examples, uh, pi zero of loops N of X is pi N of X is a group. So, so pi n of x, sorry, so it's loops n of x is a group like like um, is a group like um, E n algebra. And here's the theorem. You just stash f and me, stash f in the E1 case and me in general. And this is from the 1960s, I think. Um, the theorem is that Y is I some is it, so space Y connected space Y. Is equivalent to loops 10 of x if and only if uh, by, sorry, if and only if y is, y admits the structure of a group like E and algebra. So this is an example of higher algebra. Uh, playing an important role in topology. Yes, strictly homotopy equivalent. That's right. So Manish asks, what does equivalent mean? Equivalent means weakly homotopy equivalent. Okay. So, um, You can also ask, um, okay, so I just want to contrast this with, uh, yeah. Can you please repeat what is an uh, EN algebra? EN algebra. Uh, yeah, so who's, ask, who's asking the question? Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, hi. Yeah. So an EN algebra, I'm, I'm not going to define fully what an EN operator is in full detail, but I'll just tell you what it is right? in, in, in short. So. E, um, for every fix n, then for every k bigger than zero, I look at the space of configurations of k disks inside one unit disk, okay? All ways to embed them disjointly, disjointly from each other, just as I did in the interval case. That is a topological space. For each point in that topological space, in other words, for each configuration of k 
scale disks inside the unit disk, I will give an operation from a, a K array operation. I think someone's uh, mic is on. I will give a K array operation on the N4 loop space, a map from omega NX to omega N. Uh, omega nx to the k to omega nx. What that operation does is it an element of omega nx is a map from the n sphere into my space, which takes the base point to the base point. I can also think of this as a map from the n disk into my space, which maps the boundary of the n disk to the base point. Now I have inside my space here, I have these k n disks. I simply map, I run the first. So I have gamma one, gamma n, and I want to send them to something, right? So I run gamma one on the first disk, I run gamma two on the second disk, and so on, all the way up to gamma n. And I send the, the, the complement of these finitely many disks to the base point. That gives me a map which takes a point in E n of k and sends it to an, a k area operation. And this is compatible with various other structures that I discussed. Maybe that would be a little too much information at one time, right? But this is compatible with the ways in which you can embed disks inside these disks themselves. I mean, I can take one of these disks, I can further embed disks inside that and delete the exterior disk. And that defines a kind of structure on this collection of spaces E n of k, which makes it into what's called an opera. And, uh, and here I'm describing what an algebra over that opera is. It's giving these maps for every every k, which is compatible with that structure. I mean, it's, it's not hard to figure out what that compatibility is when you know what you're trying to model. Uh, so I think you'll be able to figure that out even without looking in a book, but, uh, or in a paper or whatever. Uh, but this is the key point. What's over here in this, uh, this is the structure that we have, right? And it has some properties that I'm not listing. So that's what it means to be an, e, an algebra with E and opera, an E and algebra. Okay, thank you. All right. So, so the, what I'm trying to convey here is that whatever the structure is, this is exactly what's needed to tell if a space is a loop space. And what what it encodes is uh, it encodes a multiplication on the on the space of loops, but it also encodes the the fact that multiplication is not associative, but associative up to homotopy, as I showed you. And in fact, if you look at the carry the four array operations and so on, those are homotopies between the homotopies that witness the associativities. For example, here I had uh, this diagram which shows you associativity, but if you go, um, I think it's not yet showing on my screen here, it's a lag, um, but you can go higher and higher in the tower and uh, you, you can look at four array operations and those will give, for if I have four elements, there will be various ways homotopies connecting them. So let me just uh, write that out over here. If I have gamma one, if these are loops now. So gamma is a loop from S1. Okay, so let's consider the n equals to one case. So you have four loops, let's say, uh, gamma one, gamma two, I can bracket it like this. I can bracket it like this. Uh, let's see, so I wanna move that over to gamma two, uh, three. Right? And here we have a homotopy, which is the one that I wrote down, the one that comes from that uh, strip with uh, divided into three, um, applied to the elements gamma one, star gamma two, a single element, gamma three and gamma four. And then I have another homotopy here, which is, I can do this one. Then I can do, this is isomorphic to uh, so this is homotopic to this guy here. And then this is homotopic to, what do I want to do now? Number one star. Right? And these are also homotopic. 
by the last associator. So I have these, uh, this pentagon of homotopies. Each of these edges is a homotopy. But uh, I have a forerie operation, right? I, I have a family of forerie operations. Of, what are they called? Ternary, no, quarter, yeah, whatever. Uh, things with four inputs. And, and that actually will tell me that there's a, there are, if I go around from the top to the bottom, by one root or the other root, those two are homotopy. So I can fill this out by a homotopy. That's the structure that an infinity algebra is encodes all of this data. Or a an E1 operand. Uh, a infinity operand, you mean? Not the no, infinity an algebra. algebra an, no, no, a infinity algebra. An algebra over the infinity operand. That's called an infinity algebra? Yes. What I just defined is an infinity algebra in spaces. Ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, I didn't define it. The chat box. Uh, if the loop spaces of, yeah, there's a question which says, if the loop space of two topological space are homotopic, what can you say about the original space? Um, well, so if you know the loop space, just as a as a space, um, then I can't really say much about the original space. But what, what I should really ask is, are the two loop spaces equivalent as A infinity algebras? Right, as groups, if you like. I mean, as objects where you have a composition. If they're homotopy equivalent as A infinity algebras, then the original spaces, uh, I'm working in the connected setting, okay? So all my spaces are connected, then the original spaces are homotopy equivalent. So knowing the loop space of a space together with its multiplication structure, but not just the fundamental group, but knowing this entire tower of you know, the data of how to multiply two loops, all possible ways to multiply two loops, all possible ways to uh, homotope, uh, you know, uh, to associate, you take gamma one star gamma two, then gamma three and uh, re-bracket it. And all the higher associators, knowing all that data is equivalent to knowing the original space. Okay. So, so maybe uh, since someone asked this question, uh, I'll just answer this. Um, I, I think uh, whoever asked the question about A infinity algebras probably had in mind A infinity algebras and chain complexes in algebra. So yes, both asked... both are. Uh, this is a sargic. Both are defined by Stashev, I believe. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So maybe I can just define that. So you can also ask. So we can also ask question. What structure do we find? We can also ask what structure do we find on chains on say loops of X with Z coefficients? And uh, or with okay, let's say with uh, with say R coefficients, okay, something so that I later on if I have some issues with characteristic, I don't want to get into trouble later when I do E N case maybe. Uh, so it, um, or let's say K is any field. So the answer. Is that it is an operand, it is an algebra over the operad chains on E1 of K. So this operad is defined by its, well, let's give this operand a name, let's call it um, the operad. Okay, let's just call it chains of E1. So chains of E1, it's K, it's K chain complex is chains on E1 of K. Okay, just by definition. So this means that I give a map from chains of E1 of K to HOM in chain complexes over K from chains on the loop space tensored uh, k times to chains on the loop space. Okay. And let's call this uh, this map 
Um, okay, so we need to understand what does chains on E1 of K look like. And, and then we should be able to spell out what this, what this data is. I claim if you think about it a little bit, th there's a model for, for this configuration space E1 of K where you can actually write down a, uh, you know, a, a cell decomposition of the space where there's only one cell in each dimension, essentially. Okay, so E1 of K has this one cell, which is what really counts. And so I'm gonna just make a claim instead of spelling it out, is that giving an E1 algebra in chain complexes, AKA an A infinity algebra is equivalent to giving uh, a chain complex, uh, a, a, well, a chain complex V comma D maps uh, MN from V tensor N to V shifted by two minus N. So where V shifted by one, well, V shifted by T is the chain complex, which at level N is, uh, let's see, I want to shift um, in the direction of the arrows. So this, I'm doing everything homologically, so I should be a little careful. So this is V, um, let's see, so I want T, my, N minus T, I guess, let's check. So if I do T equal to one, I'm suspending, so I should go the other way. If T is equal to one, then I should get V dot of T zero. And, uh, and D shifted by T is minus one to the T. Okay, so this is just uh, shifting the entire chain complex. So it's equivalent to giving these maps and uh, MN from V tensor N to V two minus N satisfying some, some equations, satisfying some quadratic equations. So what are these equations? These equations are the sum minus one to some power plus minus one uh, m u of m, sorry, so identity tensor r tensor m s tensor identity tensor t where r plus s plus t is equal to u, sorry, r plus s plus t is equal to n, and u is determined by the size of s. So for all n, this sum should be zero, where the signs I won't specify, it's some quadratic equations. So uh, let's uh, see what this gives for small values. For, so this is for all n bigger than one. So for n equal to one, we get m1 squared is equal to zero. So th th this is really, m1 is the differential, m1 is equal to d. Then for uh, n equal to two, we get that multiplication m2 from v tensor v to v is a derivation with respect to the differential t equal to m1. So what does this mean? So if I, if I write a times b by definition m2 of ab, 
and this is uh, a tensor b, sorry. And this is saying that d of a b is equal to d a times b plus minus one to the a a times d b. Then m three n equals to three says that um, m two times m two tensor identity minus m two times identity tensor m two is m one of m three minus the, the sum of the three ways of writing m one with some sign, I guess, uh, minus um, plus, plus minus of writing. Oh no, sorry, what am I saying? This is just uh, minus M3 of uh, M1. Let me just put plus minus here. Right. So, so what this is saying is that IE M uh, this expression this is a co-boundary is a boundary in home V tensor three to V shifted by minus one, right? So what this is saying is that associativity holds, but only up to homotopy. This says that M2 V tensor V to V is associative Sorry, why did I change the color? Associative up to homotopy. Yeah. So, so, and now you can try to understand what M4 and so on mean. Uh, they don't have as obvious a meaning. They mean that the, ho the homotopies witnessing the associativity are associated up to higher homotopy and so on. So you can continue this all the way up. So I gave you now two different ways. Um, I, I am sorry. Think, yeah. Um, yeah, this is Sarjik again. So I was just wondering yeah. if suspension uh, function is uh, taking the, like it should be V n plus T, no? Uh, so I'm writing things homologically. So I think oh. that's the, the thing. So if I do, it should uh, move so left. Uh, if I write things cohomologically, I want to move in the so suspension is always moving in the direction opposite to the it, it moves left, but the your arrows are like towards left in the beginning, right? Like it, it was moving from uh, right to left. So I believe it should be in plus T as well. Okay, let's see. Sorry. So so uh, maybe maybe you're right. So V uh, so if I suspend. What is in degree minus one should be in degree zero after suspending. Yes. Uh, so if I suspend, uh, so n. Ah, sorry. So if I take. Um, n plus t. Yeah, n plus t. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. You're right. And the sorry. differential. Yeah. It's minus one power. Okay, so okay, fine. This is fine. The differential of V shifted by T is minus one power. No, the no, uh, differential of V and the shift on T. So, if I sorry, the, the, the differential, notation. the differential of yeah, the yeah. shifted complex is the different yeah, original yeah. differential shift. Uh, if you shift by an even big, uh, number of steps, it's minus. Uh, sorry, it's the same differential. If you shift by an odd, uh, sorry, what have I done here? Ah, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I'm not written the right thing. A differential. Well, 
I don't know if I want to get into these details. Yeah, but okay. Yeah, 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 sorry. Sorry. At, 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 at end, no, thanks. Uh, it's minus one to the end. Yeah, yeah more or less differential of the suspension is minus of differential of the complex. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Um, but, uh, okay. So I guess I'm out of time, but, uh, let me just wrap up there. So, so, so this infinity algebra structure uh, also encodes the idea of associativity up to homotopy that we saw in the sort of other definition where I was looking at just a singular complex. There also you had composition of parts. I could just look at loops and I would get composition of loops, which are a subset of parts. And that had associativity up to, up to homotopy, but it was a different kind of thing because there I did not specify how to compose two loops. I was it was implicit in the structure of a con complex that uh, so implicit in the structure of a con complex were all possible ways of composing and and implicit in that structure is also the fact that all possible ways of composing three things are equivalent and therefore you have associativity built into the into the de abstract definition here i'm doing something different i'm giving an algebraic prescription for how to multiply loops but there are many ways to multiply loops and i'm prescribing i'm giving the prescription for every possible way to multiply loops. And I'm also giving an explicit prescription for the homotopies between those ways of multiplying and so on and so on and so on, right? But they're both modeling the same thing. So these are two different approaches to uh, modeling higher algebraic structures or higher categorical structures. One based on operatic descriptions where you specify the multiplication or composition of arrows. And the other is this sort of abstract approach where you don't specify the multiplication, but you just observe that the space of possible multiplications is contractible. And so you can sort of just specify this con complex or some other such structure where uh, the multiplication is implicitly specified and not explicitly specified. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm out of time. So I think I'll stop there for today. And uh, next time we'll see how this can be used to yeah, construct topological field theories and so on. These higher algebraic structures. Okay. Thank you, Pranav, for the great talk. Uh, are there any questions? So, Pranav, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, one question is that uh, so, uh, so, so if we take a loop space, we know that uh, probably the, the singular uh, chain complex is a infinity algebra. Mm -hmm. So now That's if right. we have yeah so if we have a k fold uh, loop space yeah then uh, is the singular uh, chains again a uh, ek algebra i mean yeah it's an ek algebra okay. in oh, chain okay. complex okay. okay 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 so the loop space itself is an ek algebra in spaces so so somehow in in hmm. usual algebra we we multiply uh, uh, we multiply elements of a set we have composition mm -hmm. energy operation elements of a set. Here, I want to also consider multiplications on objects in any category. So, so in this case, the category is topological spaces. And given a topological space, I want to define a notion of multiplying, you know, uh, energy operation on the space. So, if I have a loop space, it has energy operations parameterized by the E1 opera. If I have a k-fold loop space, I have energy operations parameterized by the EK opera. And if I pass to chain complexes, then because the functor top to, to uh, chain complexes carries products to tensor products, the derived sense, mm -hmm. uh, it takes e EK algebras in chain complexes to EK algebras in uh, sorry, EK algebras in, in spaces to EK algebras in chain complexes. Okay. So, okay. yeah. So, so anytime I have a K for loop space, that would be an EK algebra in chain complex. Mm -hmm. And you can ask if there is some kind of explicit description similar to this description of the MNs. That's a kind of, it depends on how you model the homotopy type of the EK opera. For a particular model, you would get some specific description. And I think there are, there are many descriptions. So I don't, yeah, I don't want to write down one. It's like a horrendous infinite set of uh, things that you have to specify. But I just want to mention that if you look at the EK opera, you have commutativity in the in the EK operator, which is namely that if you have two disks in a big disk, 
uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you can place one above the other and you can swap them by rotating the order. And uh, th this is what gives rise to the fact that pi two of a space is commutative, right? If you've seen, uh, anyone who's seen second homotopy group, you see that it's commutative. And the way you see it's commutative is that you can move, you can sort of shrink the two disks and then move them around each other and then make them big again. Um, but in fact, you see that if you, if you don't pass to, to uh, pi naught of the double loop space, which is the second homotopy group, and you remain at the level of the double loop space, then when you go up once around, you can take the two disks and move one around the other in a non, you know, in a complete loop, and that loop cannot be shrunk. So, so in fact, uh, the double loop space is commutative. The multiplication is commutative, but it's only so commutative. It's not infinitely. It's not something that you should really call commutative in the true sense in homotopy theory, uh, because the space of possible ways of identifying x times y with y times x is not contractible. It has a non-contractible loop in it. And uh, if you go to three dimensions, then this loop will become contractible. But now you'll have a sphere, a sphere of possible ways of, of moving that loop around. And that loop is not contractible. So truly, if you want to get something truly commutative, then you should go to n equal to infinity, you should go to uh, the E infinity operand. And that's what a homotopy theorist would call a commutative algebra, something that's an algebra over the E infinity operand. So in homotopy theory, you have this tower of things that lives between purely associative algebras, which are not, uh, which have no commutativity built into them and completely commutative things, which is the E infinity operand. And in between you have this infinite tower of things, which are, if you like, less commutative uh, algebras, uh, operands. I mean, operands that govern less commutative algebraic structures. So I have one more question. So you had defined a functor from this uh, simplicial abelian groups to chain complexes. Yeah. Uh, is the functor in the opposite direction easy to see? Yeah, it's. Um... Uh, I think you denoted it by gamma or something. Oh, did I write it? Let's see. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is not hard to see. I mean, so so okay. once you okay. know, um, I mean, I could write a formula for it. I don't know how useful that is, but basically, okay. once you know that, uh, I'm just trying to find where did I? I lost it. Um, I'm sorry you for scrolling. Yes, yes. Is it here? Ah, right here. Just ah, there you go. Yes. Ah, right, 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 right. So yeah, so. Yes, you can write a formula for it. Uh, I won't do that now, but uh, mm. let me just say that basically anytime you, you're you trying to construct a right adjoint or a left adjoint or something, uh, once you know that adjoint exists, there's sort of a canonical way to describe that adjoint. Oh, I see. Um, so you can write it as a limit mm. of some, yeah, you can write it as oh, a limit okay, basically, okay. because it's a right adjoint. Uh, so you can write a formula, but okay, I see. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I had a, I had a sort of stupid question. Um, yeah. So the first no, definition you gave. Yeah, hi, 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 Pranav. Hi. The first definition you gave of A infinity algebras was in sort of in the category of topological spaces. You defined e right. one of e uh, you. you yeah, you defined E1 of K and then you gave a map from E1 of K times. So when you are talking about uh, A infinity algebras in chain complexes, mm -hmm. so I did not understand that bit. So my question is this. So do you do a similar construction in the category of chain complexes? Like we define this chain complex E1 of K and do we, uh, and then we give this maps, this E1 of K times E1 of J, uh, J1 times E1 of J2 until times E1 of J2. And then we define sort of this uh, algebra structure over it in that category. Is that what we are doing? Because I, I got a little lost in the like exact example. So that's why I'm asking if that is the abstract understanding of this. Yeah, very good question. So there's two ways you can think of it. You could say the following. You could take chains on the E1 operator or the EK operator, whatever which is basically at each level, I take chains on the space E1 of K. 
that's what's in this type. Okay. So I take chains on the space E1, okay? And this is my, this is now an operad in chain complexes, which means that it's a sequence of chain complexes, one for every integer K, I mean, non-negative integer K, together with rules for combining, I mean, together with maps, uh, should I write out, I mean, I could write out the definition, right? I mean, I, I don't write out the full definition of an operad. It's like a kind of a little bit, uh, it just- Yes, yes, yes. I'm also not looking for the but, full definition. I'm sort right. of trying to get a, an idea of what it right. is abstractly. So, but an operad in chain complexes would be an operad O, let's say, is a sequence of chain complexes O of K, K in N. And uh, so often you assume that O of zero is uh, just a singleton and so on, but let's not put any assumptions at the moment. So, and, um, and maps O of N times O of uh, K one plus O of, Kn to O of summation K satisfying various rules. I mean, or whatever the natural compatibility conditions. Yes, yes. So yes. This is basically you, you sort of think of it as like you have k inputs. So k one inputs, then you have k two inputs. And all the way up to Kn inputs, and you you combine these and produce a single output. So here you have now, here I have one, two, all the way up to n. So so the thing that sits here is an element of O of n. I can I can take an element of O of n, and I can take an element of O of k1, O of k2, O of k sorry, oh, uh, I wrote in reverse order, O of K1, O of K2, O of Kn, and I can combine them and produce an element of O of summation Kn because at the very top I have yes. the sum of Kn elements. Right? So I can come yes, take yes, this yes. to a picture that looks like this. I mean, uh, just a single, I can just collapse the- collapse Yes, this. we can just make it into one huge, like, yeah, sort of homotopically reduce that tree, like reduce- Yeah, reduce it to something with just one vertex. Yes, exactly, 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 exactly. So that's what an operator is. It's something which has the rules how to reduce, uh, which yes. tell you how to reduce this picture to a single uh, vertex tree. And I told you how that works for the little end disk operator. You simply put the yes. take the, the disks and put disks inside each of the disks and then delete the outer disks. That's yes, the yes, process yes. by which you collapse this. And so now instead of operator in spaces, I can do operator in chain complexes, which is a sequence of chain complexes with, with uh, sorry, maps. Now I have tensor product here, no, uh, sorry. I take the tensor product, tensor product, tensor product, and I can map this to yes. over the sum. And uh, that's it. So now you just define an algebra over this. It's just a collection of maps. It's just an object with a, with those certain maps to the homes. Yeah. With, with so, all the compatibility conditions. Right. So so maybe a, a good way to say this is that there is a particular operator. So if V is an object in chains, of, if V is a chain complex, Then you can define endomorphism operad of V. So ah, this operad with, which is uh, end VN is HOM from V tensor N to V. And an algebra over O is just a map from the operad O to the endomorphism operad of some chain complex V. I see, I see, I see. So, so the particular example you gave was, a, so there the operad O where the singular chain complexes over e of e1 of k. And so if we have a loop space, its singular chain complex would be an example of the of an uh, algebra over this operand in chain complexes. Okay. That's right. That's, yes. Yes. That's right. yes. Thank you. Now I follow. Yeah. So, so, so broadly, the point of my talk was to say there are two different ways to model the idea of uh, two classes of ways to model the idea of, of composition up to higher associativity and you know with with some notion of higher associativity and 
higher commutativity and so on. One is to give it implicitly, like we did for Khan complexes. And the other is to say explicitly specify all the operations, which is the operatic approach, the operatic description. And this gives two entirely different classes of ways to sort of two complementary class of ways to model uh, higher categories and higher algebraic structures. So, so in particular, uh, in, in both these things, we can work, we can start with a one category and then construct a model of a higher category in that category. Is that what we have been doing? And I, I, I don't mean, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, I, I haven't yet discussed that. So maybe uh, that's something I would say next time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can start with a one category and describe high category structures just using ordinary category theory. But that's one of the ways to model higher categories, but I haven't yet talked about that. Um, yeah, I, my, the point so far has just been to motivate how do these higher algebraic structures come up? So today we saw that de-looping is one, you know, finding out when a space is a loop space is, is one of the ways that this, this uh, higher algebraic structures arose very naturally. And that's a very natural question in homotopy theory uh, yes. for a bunch of reasons that I didn't have time to talk about, but also just from first principles, it's a natural question. Um, and uh, the implicit uh, definition comes about just by studying the, the when you look at the, the Khan complex definition just comes by looking at the singular co complex of a space, which again is a very natural thing, which you get by looking at paths and paths between paths and so on in the space. Um, okay, the, so so that was not really my question. So for example, for operats, we can, uh, so we have defined operats, like an operatic yes. structure. In, in two different categories. So first we defined it in topological space, in the category of topological spaces. Then we defined it in yes. the category of chain complexes. So similarly for Khan, yes. like for, for the Khan complex construction also, we can take functors from simplicial sets to the category of sets or the category of topological spaces and then things like, yeah. So hmm. what I'm sort of trying to ask is, so, like I'm, I'm taking the example of these topological spaces or chain complexes. So I'm saying, are there nice, this kind of nice one categories inside which we can sort of create this operatic structures or this con complex structures? And like, is that what you have described so far? Uh, you can define operators in any symmetric monoidal category. Yes. So, so, the, so, yes, so, so, yes. Now that this is a more concrete question. So, given any symmetric monoidal and ca monoidal category. Can we create a model of an A infinity category in that symmetric monoidal category by describing an opera? Yes, I mean, uh, well, mm, yeah, you, you can, well, not in any A infinity category, but uh, maybe let me not, uh, I think this is a question for a longer discussion. I mean, it depends what yeah. we mean by A infinity opera in, in, in some category and so on. So, I see. Uh, I mean, it's a good question. You can ask uh, what it means to be an A infinity operator and in what setting does that make sense? Um, yes, yes. And I've defined it in two yes, sets. That was my question. Like in what setting does it make sense? So right. we, we, you have shown two particular examples, but in what other settings does it make sense? That was the question. Thank you. Right, right. Yeah, so, but I think it will yeah, be- I'm also not discussion. looking for an answer immediately. I understand it's a difficult, like of course it is a complicated question, but I wanted to ask if there is a question like this that makes sense. So yeah. Sorry. Are there any more questions? I, I have one more. Okay. I'm sorry. Hmm. So in the middle of the lecture, you asked two questions. So you answered question two, I assume. So question yes. one isn't yet answered. Hasn't yet been answered. Uh, I don't okay. know how much time people have. So if, if there's five minutes, I can answer the question. Otherwise, I'll take it for okay. the next lecture. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually 20 minutes past. So perhaps we can yeah. discuss that in the next lecture. Yeah, I'll do that in the next lecture. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Pranav, for the great talk and also very carefully answering all the questions from our, um, uh, from our audience. So next we'll be meeting on um, Tuesday, that is the 7th of December at the same time, 5.30 to 7. And Sarjik, your question uh, uh, will most likely be answered on that day. So I hope you can wait for the next few days. Uh, yes, thanks uh, in advance. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, thanks everyone for, um, for attending this talk and see you again on Tuesday. All right, bye-bye. See you, thank you everyone.